This is Fans on the Run, a podcast made by, for, and about Beatles fans. And now, here's your host, Ethan Alexander. Welcome, 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 welcome back to Fans on the Run. Last time I did six hello or welcomes, the time before I did five. You know, I'm just, I'm driving the train off the cliff here. I don't know when to stop. I don't know when to stop. So that, that, <laughs> that describes the show. Anyways, I'm going to shut up because actually, you know what? Feel free to leave in the comments if you think I should shut up and actually let my guests talk. Um, cause no one has told me that I'm not funny yet. So all, all it takes is one YouTube comment saying, stop it with your jokes. They're not funny. You think you're funny. Just stop. Anyways, this isn't going anywhere. We, we have a phenomenal guest for you today. From 2001 to 2019, he was a member of a collective led by a living legend. A living legend that will live long after other living legends have died. Sadly, he is no longer a living legend, but a legend just the same. Our guest was a Ruddle, he was a Bonzo, he's a phenomenal guitar player. Please welcome to the show, Ruddling Ken Thornton. Hey, Ethan. Hello, everybody. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Was that introduction, you know, full enough? Well, you know, I don't know who's spreading these rumors about me being phenomenal, but, you know. Oh, Ken. <laughs> Give yourself some credit, buddy. Eh. So. <laughs> so where do you want to start, sir? I, you know, I'm trying to figure this out. You know, I'm, I'm just going to go right back to the beginning. Ken. How did you first discover the Beatles? Oh, okay. Um, so, I first discovered the Beatles. It was my Aunt Karen. I was a very small boy. And I used to really look forward to going to the Quad Cities, like Moline area, because mm -hmm. I knew I was going to be seeing my Aunt Karen and hearing the Beatles music mm -hmm. and other types of things like that. She was She was a, you know... She was there when it all started. Mm -hmm. She had all the scrapbooks with, you know, fab and gear and all those words yeah. written next to fab pictures of the Beatles. Fab and gear and all those other pimply hyperboles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apologies to any of our English listeners. If you ever see me in the street, I, f I give you permission to slap me. <laughs> um, so it really started with her, and, and I remember it. Um, I think my first record that I got when I got my first little record player when I was probably five or six was Yesterday and Today. And she probably had something to do with that. But um, she, she gave me a stack of 45s when I was really little. And it was all, you know, 60s stuff. Yeah. Monkeys, Beatles monkeys, uh, the doors, the human beings. Oh, cool um, aunt. Uh Yeah. And uh, Arthur Brown, all sorts oh, of stuff. Oh, your and, aunt gave you Arthur Brown? Yeah. yeah and I, okay, your aunt <laughs> is awesome. I can still remember. I mean, I have very clear memories of me sitting with my little record player and just putting on 45s and just listening to them and watching them spin around. I don't know just, how much of know. a good childhood influence hearing some guy shout, I am the god of hellfire <laughs> and I bring <laughs> you... Yeah. Well, that's exactly true, because I, I remember being, I loved the sound of it, okay. but I was also terrified by it. Yeah. So. Especially if you, yeah, if so you that's saw it started, like, really. Arthur Brown's face with all the makeup and the fire well, on his yeah. head. That would have been that even more terrifying. came many years later. <laughs> yeah, it came much later. Um, but yeah, but since I was very small, they were always my favorite band. And uh, it's it's still to this day that's it's my favorite band ever. Period. And everything related to it, their solo careers, obviously the Ruddles, mm -hmm. uh, Apple bands. Uh, but I mean, it 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 kind of had a lot of um, other, like sort of peripheral things that I also got into, like Indian classical music. Mm -hmm. I got really into Northern Indian classical music because of George and Ravi Shankar and um, you know, I don't know. It's I love the sound of their instruments, and uh, I really got into 
mostly the instrumental side of things. That's the, the northern Indian stuff is mostly instrumental, but um, but that's also because as a I young kid, I was listening to. <laughs> I actually did get a sitar because a friend of mine had one. And I had it restored and uh, kind of started learning how to play it properly. I'm not very good. But... I have an electric sitar, but that's that's like, not like a coral. Yeah. Oh wow! But it it's it's it hardly bears any resemblance to an actual sitar. Uh, you can play like a uh, green tambourine. But again, by Steely Dan and stuff. Yeah. I could though, couldn't I? Yeah. Um. So let's see, what was I saying? Oh yeah. So because of George, you know, I I'm listening to sounds like you know, um, Serangi and um, Shanai and stuff, like uh, the Inner Light. I used to play the Inner Light a lot more than Lady Madonna when I had that 45. You were a smart kid. And, and within you, without you, you know, to me, that's one of my favorite songs on the album. Where <laughs> a lot of people was like, "Why is that on there?" Yeah. But to me, that's like one of my favorite ones. I don't get the stories hearing. Or I don't get hearing the stories of, you know, within you, without you being track one on side two, just so people could skip it. Um, oh, I'd have never heard that, but <laughs> but it's it's such a good song. It's a fantastic song. It is. It's beautiful. I love the instrumentation and uh, the you know the time signature that the, that it's in. Everything is right. It's beautiful. And uh, I think maybe, you know, the the laughter at the end is kind of funny. Yeah. It's just he thought it was maybe a bit too heavy, so he had to put that at the end. And uh it's a lot louder on the mono one. Oh yeah. I'm assuming you know the mono pepper. I do know the mono inside pepper. Inside and out, yeah. It's the best one really. For me anyway. I just love the sound of I, it. I can't listen to the original stereo mix of pepper. It I find it extremely hard. I can listen to. I I really like the new Giles Martin remix, but yeah. I I don't like listening to the original stereo mix. Do you um do you get into the surround mixes? I I you know a lot of people have been trying to egg me on to getting a surround <laughs> system, like our good friend Scott Erickson, who says hello. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Scott. Uh, John Montana. Yeah. He. Yeah. These people have been telling me you need to get a surround system to hear like the new 5.1 Beatles mixes. Mm -hmm. But that's always been one of my hobbies is surround music. So like quad eight tracks and mm -hmm. uh, discrete CD4 record albums and things from the 70s. I've, it's always been a hobby of mine, this surround music. And now you've got all these really nice digital 5.1 mixes and things. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I I really enjoy that, and that's what I've been I've been doing a bit of that lately, checking out some things down in the basement with my surround system. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it's a lot of fun, <laughs> and I enjoy that it's not just that you hear things in a, you know they're separated and they're surrounding you in that, but you hear usually you'll hear vocal parts and guitar parts and things that were left out of the original. Or that they were just buried in the mix to begin with. Yeah, things like that too, yeah, for sure. The main draw for me in wanting to get a 5.1 system isn't the Beatles stuff. It's the fact that I know there is a 5.1 remix of both of the Dukes of Stratosphere albums. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I I feel like I need to get the it. Surroundabout. Surroundabout ride. Yeah, it just came out. Like was last year, I think. Yeah, I I yeah. need to pick up that. Yeah, I love the Dukes. I love XTC and the Dukes, and yeah, and all those all the XTC surround mixes are really fantastic too. I say Andy Partridge those, did a I've great like job. Six or seven of them now, and they're all great. Mm. So, what was the first Beatles album you owned? Well, the first one I I had. Oh, apart um, from yesterday and today. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I don't really have a clear memory of it. I have a memory of finding the Hard Day's Night soundtrack at a garage sale or something when I was really little. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all, it's a little bit hazy now, like which ones I had first. I just, I, I just would buy whatever I could find mm -hmm. at the, like the used record shops and have my parents buy things for me. Um, I'm clear, I, I have a clear memory of the, my favorites, because I, well, I had things on record and 8-track and cassette. I just had <laughs> different formats, but uh, Sgt. Pepper, 
and Revolver and the White Album and Abbey Road were my favorites. And of course I had the the Red and the Blue compilation albums that were put out in 73. I played the heck out of those. Oh, yeah. Um so yeah, I don't have a really clear memory of the first ones I intentionally bought. I remember I had a Hard Day's Night soundtrack album until my brother threw it against the wall for some reason and shattered it. Do you remember why he <laughs> threw it against the wall? <laughs> well, I don't know. I must have done something to make him mad, and he just decided to destroy something I loved. <laughs> what a dick. Well, no, it's, he was five years older, and it was, you know, that's just the way it was then, you know. He's a typical older brother that sits on your head and farts, you know, all those sorts of things, you know. <laughs> now I so, appreciate my older brother a bit more. <laughs> oh, it all worked out okay in the end. Because if he know, ever just... laid a finger on one of my Beatles records, I would fucking <laughs> kill him. <laughs> No, we it, it was it was just you know when we were very young things were a little bit like that. Um, uh, but you know once we got older things mellowed out and we you know we got along. He ended up being uh, you know he was a fellow Ruddles fan when the Ruddles came out. So yeah, he just couldn't believe when I ended up being part of that. And I still can't believe it really. But uh, I'm gonna um, jump to that. How did you okay. first get involved with the Ruddles? Um, well, do you want me to start with how I even kind of heard about that? Sure. And when I was a kid, um, so when I was young, my favorite things were the Beatles and Monty Python, Saturday Night Live. And, uh, I don't, I still don't know how I convinced my dad to let me stay up late on Sunday nights and watch Monty Python on PBS, but. Um, he did, <laughs> and even at that young age, I just I, I thought they were hilarious. And so when I heard about this Ruddles thing that was coming on, I, I I knew it was a combination of all these things that were my favorite things at the time. So, and I've said this before, but for me, it was sort of like my Ed Sullivan show. Mm -hmm. I was waiting all week to watch this thing. I was so excited about it. I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. Did it live up to the hype for you? For me, definitely. Yeah. What is your favorite and, and, moment from the Ruddles movie? Oh, that's a tough one. And I mean the first one, not the awful second one. Oh, yeah. Can't buy me lunch. Yeah, um, yeah the from the first one, I don't know, I, probably Piggy in the Middle. I, I quote. There's so many good parts, but... <laughs> I quote it at least once per episode, on a normal yeah. episode, not when I'm, <laughs> you know, I have a Ruddle on the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, one of my favorite things from it is the trousers bit oh, yeah. because it's it was everywhere. And if you watch it, all the all the, like the the interviews and appearances that George Harrison made, like in seventy eight, seventy nine, and eighty, he always says something about oh, I think it was the trousers. <laughs> it's like he was so into it; he was into it up to his neck, yeah. and he just loved it. But uh, when you joined the Ruddles, did you with... adopt the tight trousers? No. Well, I think maybe when I was in high school, I did. Does that mean you were there, ever yeah. really a member of the Ruddles then? <laughs> if you did not embrace the tight well, trousers? By, by the time I joined, they were more into, you know, the fact that we could iron our own trousers, not how tight they were. Yeah. You know, so it was a little different scene by the time I was there. And um, so um, anyway, I, I watched the show. And I was just, yeah, I was just so excited about it. I went out to, and bought the album and the 8-track. And I just played the heck out of those. Because uh, to me, the music was as good as any Beatle record. I played it as often as any Beatle record. And my brother did, too. There are some Ruddle songs where I will listen to them more than, you know, their Beatles equivalent. Like, I'll listen mm -hmm. to I Must Be In Love more than anything on the Hard Day's Night album. Yeah. I'll listen to Piggy in the Middle more than I am the Walrus. You know, I'll I'll even <laughs> listen to uh, Nevertheless more than Love to You. Yeah. Or Love You Too. I, Love You Too. Yeah. I always get the order of the words mixed up. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. But I think uh, what's well, kind of like uh, I'm the Walrus, Mo from the Ministry, oh, Piggy in the Middle, they're just all fantastic, aren't they? Yeah. 
Now I'm going to have Wolf from the Ministry stuck in my head all day. Yeah. <laughs> you could have worse things stuck in there, you think. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just, I, I, from when I was very young, the Ruddles were, uh, were a big thing for me. I just loved the music. And, I mean, they're so, the songs are brilliant. Mm-hmm. And I, it was a long time before I really tried to look into anything more about Neil or the Bonzos. Mm-hmm. Um, like things that were related to the Ruddles. It, it was a while before that happened. Um, of course, I discovered a lot of great Neil, Neil Innes-related albums and Bonzos later. Um, what was the and, first Bonzos album that you recall hearing? Uh, well, the first thing I heard was a compilation, mm-hmm. uh, not a, not a, one of the regular studio Was it like a Bestiality of the his, Bonzos? History of the Bonzos, I think. Yeah. Was, yeah, the double album one. And then there was a CD I got like in 86 or 7 that was that first Rhino one that came out. Mm-hmm. And um, it was uh, you know, a good friend of mine, is uh, Greg, got me into the Bonzos properly, introduced me to them and uh, the compilations, and then I went out and found all the actual albums and I hope someone yeah, out there, just, their first introduction to the Bonzos was the intro and the outro. I hope that was somebody's yeah. introduction. <laughs> I imagine it was for quite a few people. Because it was on a single in the UK, I think. What? And yeah, I think so. Yeah, they, oh, the single in the UK, didn't That they? was bold. Um, and uh, so... Trying to think. Oh, of course, the, my, the first Bonzo thing I heard was in Magical Mystery Tour film, mm-hmm. um, Death Cab for Cutie. Uh, I'm not sure where to go from there, really. But <laughs> so, how did you how did you join, or how did you meet Neil Innes? And oh, okay. So I, I met Neil in in '94 at a Beatle Fest in Chicago. Mm-hmm. So. Um, it was the first time he had done the the Beatles conventions, and I I remember really clearly um, so many things from that weekend because that by that point I was really immersed in it and I knew like his solo stuff and I was really excited to hear him actually play like the protest song live mm-hmm. and and stuff like that and uh, no matter who you vote for the government, government always, always gets, gets in. yeah. All these things, it's like I, you know, I just couldn't believe it. And I think I was, I must have been somewhat of an awkward fan, you know. But I have pictures of us from then, and I look totally relaxed. I'm making like goofy faces and everything, so I don't look particularly nervous. But, um, you know, he was kind of like you know one of my musical heroes uh, from the Ruddles thing and everything. So, um. So we we met then, and and somehow I kept in touch with him every once in a while uh, for the next, I don't know how many years, uh, four or five years. I became friends with the drummer of the Ruddles. John Halsey. Yeah, um, because he was in a band called Pato. He was also in in a wonderful band called Time Box. Yeah, Time Box is basically what Pato grew out of. I love Time Box. Yeah. Yeah, they were great. And Chris Holmes, the keyboard player, left to do other things like Babe Ruth and stuff. But and they became a four-piece and started and changed the name to Pato. But you know, listening to the Ruddles, uh, you know, uh, John Halls, he's uh, obviously he's a, he's a drummer on the Ruddles, and Ali Halsell, this amazing guitarist, was the guitar player. But when you just listen to the Ruddles music, you wouldn't necessarily walk away thinking just how incredibly amazing these guys were as musicians because they're they're doing things within Ruddle's framework. Mm-hmm. They're not showing off or showing all their chops. You know, they're doing what they need to do to give a Beatles type of vibe, a Ruddle's vibe. Mm-hmm. So when I heard this Pato stuff, and I heard John drumming and Ollie playing this just jaw jaw dropping stuff, you know, I was just like, holy crap! Where did these guys come from? You know, the the stuff they were doing back then too is just. They're one of the first bands that I would say was kind of like a, a rock and jazz sort of hybrid or fusion. Um, like Iggin Bottoms Wrench with Alan Holzer was maybe one a little bit earlier, but they were one of the first bands kind of doing that, like weird type signatures, but still mostly in a rock kind of 
uh, vein, you know. And it's and, pre uh, Steely Dan. Oh yeah, and um, so I just got really into this band, and really into Ollie uh, uh, as a player, and so I started researching this band. I said, well, you know, there's nothing on the internet about these guys, well, virtually nothing, and and I'm really having trouble finding out learning anything about them. So I made a decision that I was going to research the band, try to find all the articles I could. I started buying um, old music papers from the UK, <laughs> Melody Maker, NME, uh, Sounds, all, all that kind of stuff, trying to find articles on these guys. And I found a guy over there who had a, uh, I'm not sure if he's still around, but he, he, was, he kind of specialized in music papers. It was called Back Numbers. And <laughs> He had a list of like all, all these all these uh, issues have at least an article or a record review or something about Pato. So I bought all of them, and um, it didn't take long for me to decide to make a website. So I called John and I said, "Well, you know, would you do some interviews with me and tell me some details and stuff and um, help me make this website better?" And he, you know, he told me stories. Um. So I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little because there was a time in 1997, three years after I met Neil, <laughs> the you know they, the Ruddles put out their archaeology album in '96, and that kind of really happened because of the good experience that Neil had at those Beatle Fests in '94. He had no idea that there was people out there listening to the Ruddles albums. For him, it was just a, a project that he did. He had no idea that, that all these Beatle fans loved the Ruddles as well. So that's a big part of why archaeology happened. But then they came. It was Neil, Ricky, and John. Mm -hmm. They came and they did the Chicago Beetle Fest and the L.A. Beetle Fest. Mm -hmm. um, so of course I was there. I was yeah. I just couldn't believe it. So I got to see them play with uh, Liverpool, which has yeah. been like the sort of like the house band for Beetle Fest forever. And uh, it was amazing. And I I flew out to L.A. to see him again. I mean. That's for me at the time. That was kind of crazy, mm -hmm. like flying all the way across the country to see these guys play. <laughs> you know, that was nuts. Um, but I had to do it. Because they're the and, rebels. Yeah, and that was the first time I really got to sit down much with Neil, uh, even though I was still kind of, you know, I didn't want to impose. You know, I was kind yeah. of. Yeah, controlling myself. <laughs> but John agreed to meet with me for breakfast at, after the fest was done, and we sat there for, it must have been like two hours. And uh, he told me all these hilarious stories about Pato and the, just the things that they would do on stage, you know, all the looning about. And, you know, they were hilarious, the things that they would do. And, and it's, it's a shame, just like the Bonzos, it's kind of a shame there isn't more of a video document of the things they, they did. Um, just just to jump in here, what Pado songs would you recommend for like a first time listener? Okay. Um, well, in general, a lot of people seem to think the first album is better from a song standpoint. The second album is 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 like Ollie's most impressive guitar playing. Mm -hmm. And if you want to hear what Ollie could do on a guitar, listen to a song called "Give It All Away." It's on the Hold Your Fire album, and you know you'll see what I'm talking about with time signatures. That the the time signatures are changing throughout the song, but it still feels somewhat um, natural. Mm -hmm. But when the solo starts, it's a great example of, of what Ali could do. I and mean, he's just it's, he's just this brilliant player. And it's not just that he can play that he could play fast and smoothly and cleanly and do this really impressive legato hammer-on pull-off kind of stuff that nobody was else was really doing at the time. Mm -hmm. It's the notes that he chose to play. He had this, you know, kind of, I don't, I don't know, it's a certain something, you know, where he can kind of step outside of the, the normal scales and things that people would play. He'd just, just do this off-the-wall stuff, and, and, he, could just, and he, he, would, he would come out of it with the next chord changed and right there, you know, just, I don't know. It's one of those things where I wish I had that little, like that crazy magic spark that's going on mm -hmm. there. Uh, so that's a really good example. There's uh, some really, there's another one that's called Warm um, Red Glow. That's got some great stuff on it. It's a, it's a really good jamming song by the band. Um, 
And there's a, a really crazy song called Loud, Loud Green Song on the third album. Um, those are really good kind of guitar examples. But you also have um, uh, more, I don't know, thoughtful songs yeah. and uh, kind of more on the mellower side, like You, you Point Your Finger is a really good one. And um, Time to Die. I mean, well, for me, I'm a little biased because I love it all. But those are a few that I would say, you know, check those out if you, and, and see if it makes you want to look further. Because <laughs> they, they only did they did three albums that were released, two on Vertigo and one on Island. And the one on, by, the, by the time they got to the one on Island, Ollie was kind of over the Guitar Hero thing. He plays more keyboards on that album than, than guitar. Um and then they did a fourth album called Monkey's Bum that didn't come out until uh, several years ago officially. It's the first time it was released, and it's a great record. It's signs of where they maybe were heading, uh, which was a bit more commercial and better songs, maybe more commercial songs. But it wasn't really something Ollie was into, so Ollie left at that point, unfortunately. And I, I just like that, and. I would urge any of our listeners uh, for from pre Pado. Um, how do you say the name of the band again? I I could. Which one? Time box. No, not Time box. Oh, not Time box. You say P- Pado. Uh, yeah, Pado. Pado's like from like seventy to seventy three. I don't know why I forgot how to pronounce that for a second. Uh, anyways. Yeah. Anyone out there, listen to the song Gone is the Sad Man by Timebox. If you're into yeah. British psych from the 60s, it is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And uh, Poor Little Heartbreaker is a really good kind of rocking song that they did towards the end there. Anyways, before I um, so rudely interrupted you, uh, well, several times right. at this point... Uh, Beetlefest 97, there were the Ruddles, and you were talking with John Halsey. Yeah. So, well, actually, since we mentioned it, um, the uh, I did actually end up creating that Paddle website, mm-hmm. and it's just paddlefan.com. So everything, all the information I managed to find in articles, whether it's, you know, interviews, gig reviews, album reviews, everything I could find on Paddle and Timebox and Boxer, which was an album that Mike Paddle and Ali Halsell did in the mid '70s, mm-hmm. it's all out there. It's more of an archive now because I I haven't really found anything new to share. But um, so that's for anybody that decides to look into the band more, want just kind of learn more about the the band. Um, that's that's a resource. There's also a a, a website devoted to Ollie Halsell that my friend Barry Monks created called Caves. So that's worth looking into as well. Go check them out. Um, so yeah, back to the um, Beetle Fest, as it was still called yeah. at the time, um, in L.A. And yeah, John was just telling me all these hilarious stories. For it must have been a couple hours, and and you know I don't drink coffee, but by the time we were done talking, I was just like <laughs> I was vibrating from just drinking cup after cup. Um, so anyway, that was that was after that. I started talking to him on the phone and learning more and more and uh, stuff that ended up helping make this, the website more informed and accurate. And then uh, that is what really indirectly leads to me becoming better friends with Neil and uh, ultimately playing music with him. Is um, So my friendship with John had a big role in that because I decided to go over in 2000 to visit John and show him the website because at the time he still didn't have internet. Mm-hmm. So I could just tell him I could tell him what I was doing, but he couldn't really see it for himself. So I went over there and I took him over to the to the library in Cambridge, and we um, just I just showed him the whole site there in the in the uh, uh, library. What? And I had arranged to meet Neil at his after his show in Liverpool mm-hmm. during that same trip. Um. And it's just it's a most amazing trip because I ended up being invited to a, a family reunion from Mike Paddle's family unexpectedly. Uh, it just it was a crazy. I, I just can't tell you, Ethan. It was just amazing. But anyway, so I went and saw um, Neil play his show in Liverpool, and we had, I said, "Well, let me just meet you afterwards. I'll buy you a drink or something." And so 
that ended up being me and Neil and his wife, Yvonne, mm -hmm. sitting in the ballroom of the Adelphi Hotel. This was during, like, the Beatle weekend they have every year yeah. in August. And we were the only three in that entire ballroom. And I got to ask him all the questions I'd always wanted to, to ask him. And uh, it was just um, amazing for me conversation. And I asked him some things like, you know, what the heck is a caravan site? Because, you know, in the song, How Sweet to Be an Idiot, he sings that line about, you know, as much imagination imagination is a caravan site. And I'm like, I had no idea what in the world that was. To me, a caravan, you know, is like a bunch of, um, you know, people out in the desert with their camels. <laughs> Not, you know, but anyway, he, t he laughed when I asked him and he said, well, it's like a mobile home. It's like a trailer park. Mm -hmm. So he was amused at some of my questions being, an, you know, the American sort of uh, separated by a common language sort of thing, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we just kept talking about various things, all the questions I asked. At one point I said, um, you know, I was going back to London and my hotel was horrible. It's one of those horrible, like, places where you don't even want to step on the carpeting and bare feet, yeah. you know. And he said, well, why don't you come stay with us for a night? What? <laughs> it's like, this, this, this trip to England was just like, I, I could have never guessed anything like this, all those things would have happened. So I played it cool, and I was like, well, I've got this Pato family union thing. Uh, maybe I could come Monday. <laughs> so... Anyway, I, I I figured out how to get to where they were. I got to the train station. And he came, picked me up, and uh, I remember having dinner with the, with them and their son Miles. And after dinner, he just said something about, I, "I'm gonna, do you mind if I bring out a couple acoustic guitars?" And next thing I know, I'm sitting there with him playing Ruddle songs and Bonzo Dog Band songs and solo songs. And then he started playing songs I'd never heard before, things he hadn't recorded yet at all. Oh, wow. And th I think, if anything, maybe that's the thing that maybe made an impression on him because I picked up on those songs and was throwing my own things in, you know, as we played through them. And I, I'm, and one in particular, I know, um, what was it, uh, Face Mail in the Meat Zone, a couple of little bits that I did actually ended up being used in the final... Uh, demo he released anyway. Um, so I'm thinking maybe that's what might have made an impression um, apart from just being able to play a bit. But he had known me somewhat for six years, but that was the first time that he realized I played music. Mm -hmm. I played guitar. And after, by the, before I left, he said something. He said, um, I don't know where, I don't know when, but someday I'll be pulling you up on stage to play some. And and it happened the following year um, at the same place I first met him. At the Beatle at Fest. At the Beatle Fest in Chicago, 2001. And I had to say, I was scared shitless. But <laughs> it was amazing. Well, wouldn't you be? You know, yeah, yeah, I was, well, you know, I wasn't really, uh, you know, accustomed to playing for quite so many people at the time anyway, but to do it with him, you know, he, he did his best to make me feel comfortable, but it was still, it was one of those things where in my mind, I was also thinking, don't blow it. Yeah. Man. You've got to play as well as you can. So you get asked back, or at least you have a chance of being asked back. And that's kind of it. That sort of mentality affected me for the first couple of years of playing with him. You know, it's like, I felt if I don't do my best, if I make mistakes, he might not, ask me back um, so we did that and it was amazing fun and I thought it went real well and then a few months later um, he said uh, you know we're going to do like the first Ruddles gigs ever um, it wasn't a big long tour it was just a few like a couple dates mm -hmm. but um, it was in October and he, he ended up inviting me to be part of that. So those were the very first Ruddle shows, or the ones that I would call Ruddle shows. There was there was one, I think, the year before in 2000 where it was like a bunch of guests were singing the songs, mm -hmm. like Nigel Planer and people like that. Um, 
but these were the first gigs where it was Neil and John singing all the Ruddle songs, and we were doing songs from both albums with a couple things like Urban Spaceman and a few of his solo songs in there as well. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was it was a bit crazy flying over there a, a month after 9-11 happened. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, I got there, and we uh, had rehearsals, and there's some funny things I remember about it, like, because I've, I've been playing these acoustic versions with Neil, and which meant I was, like, especially like songs in archaeology, I'm trying to throw in some of the keyboard parts. Mm -hmm. And when I showed up for rehearsal, I just kind of naturally was doing some of those things, and Mickey had to say, do you, do you mind if I play my, <laughs> my keyboard parts? <laughs> so anyway... Um, it was that was just amazing too, you know. And it, at, uh, it was a couple of years after that we started touring more regularly. Once or twice a year we'd do a tour of the UK. And um, I can't tell you, just, you know, how amazing it was to get to play those songs with with Neil and the rest of the guys and and John. Well, I tell you, John is is he's really is one of the funniest people that there is in the world. And on stage, those those earliest gigs. Um, earliest tours, it was almost kind of dangerous to be in a band with him because he just never knew what he was going to do. And I, if I look over to him, he'd make a face or he'd do something. <laughs> like he, he'd pretend like he was going to hit a cymbal really hard and then he'd hit it like really, you know, barely touch it, you know. just He would make me laugh all the time that I would screw up and forget what chords I'm supposed to be playing. Um, so yeah, John is just an, an amazing, hilarious person. He's Really good, fun to hang around with him. Um, How did you so, earn the nickname Ruddling Ken Thornton? I don't know. Neil just said it one day, and it stuck. He just said it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's next thing I knew, it was even being you know included on posters and things. Um, uh, I can, I'm trying to remember if it was in the first tour program for those. Those that two, those 2001 shows because this is funny too. Um, he asked me for a, a, a publicity photo, mm -hmm. and I, you know, Ethan, I wasn't really you know a touring musician or a professional musician. Yeah. I was working as a, a, a computer programmer, playing music as a serious hobby with bands. I always been like three or four bands at a time. At the, you know, especially back then, I think it was in four bands at once. Oh, and wow. So I was playing a lot, but I wasn't doing anything that was traveling around the country and touring where I would need a publicity photo. Yeah. So what I did was I sent him my first publicity photo, which was my first baby photo. And I was <laughs> something like, I don't know, it was probably four months old or something like that. <laughs> and that's what they used in the tour program. And uh, because of that, I think he used a very silly picture for John Halsey. It's like some very old man holding a bundle of sticks or something. And for the horn players who are, um, I'm trying to remember their names now. They were from, um, oh gosh, I'm spacing out on the keyboard player's name. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm kind of spacing out now. Oh my goodness. Well, I can't think of it, but we borrowed these key, these horn players from the, from his band. <laughs> And uh, the picture for them was like a couple of cows. <laughs> was, you know, but everyone else had, you know, regular, you know, publicity photos. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, you know, it was fun from the get-go. You know, he appreciated my silly idea of using this, you know, baby photo. I wasn't taking myself seriously yeah. at all. You know, it was, it was, it was always about the fun. It was never like, you know, something to build up into into a big thing or a um, career move is the phrase that Neil used to use all the time. It's, it's not a career move. It was only ever about fun, not money or trying to get, you know, build it up into something huge. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's, that's how it started. And uh, we took a break there for a while. A number of years we didn't tour. It's just, there's a lot of baggage that comes with the Ruddles too, you know, the legal stuff yeah. and, uh, so there was a period of time where we took a break, and then when we we started touring again in uh, 2013, we we got an offer we couldn't refuse, 
to come play the uh, the fest, the August Beetle Fest in uh, Liverpool, mm -hmm. and then um, our promoter that we knew said, "Well, why don't we make a tour out of it?" So that's how it got started again. So 2013, we started touring again, and we did all the way up until uh, 2019. How did how did the uh your tour with the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band happen? Um, well, there was there were there was the idea of having a combination show had been thrown around before, and they finally did decide to do something in what was it 2015, I yeah. think. And so it was going to be one show in London, and um, it was decided that the the Ruddles would play first. And then the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band would do a set of more like the you know mostly like the novelty songs, the novelty '78s, mm -hmm. and things like that. Plus, I think a couple of songs that Rodney had written, more like newer stuff, and um, like the, you know, so they did the kind of like the zany. Um, uh, what would be it's like uh, hunting tigers out in India, stuff like, like that. Jollity Farm. Yeah, stuff like that. And then, then they would have a third set where it was more like the later electric kind of Bonzo stuff. Mm -hmm. And the Ruddles were the backing band for that. And we would have people like Rodney come out and play, Legs Larry Smith, uh, Sam Spoons. And so we did a set of, of the more more of the later, um, you know, I shouldn't say later because a bunch of it was still a gorilla period on. But we did, you know, gorilla through Kanch and stuff, the more electric stuff. Mm -hmm. And we also had a guy named um, Michael Livesley, you've probably heard mm -hmm. of, and he did the Sir Henry shows. Um, it's amazing that guy, he's, he remembered all that dialogue from, from Sir Henry and did these stage shows. And Neil was involved in some of those. I think, I think John Halsey was and Rick Wakeman and people like that. Um, so we had Michael Livesley singing some of the Vivian Stanchel songs, and we had David Catlin Birch, who uh, is a wonderful guy. He he was actually on the last Ruddles tour playing bass and singing. Mm -hmm. um, and he would come get up and do like rhinocratic oaths because uh, he just had this thing where he could recite that whole thing from memory. Um, so, I mean, it was just a, an amazing, fun night. And we ended up doing two more later in the year. We did one in, um, what was it, Brighton, I think. Yeah, we did one in, in Brighton, and then we did one in Greenwich. I got in the outside outskirts of London, uh, O2. And those are just, you know, amazingly fun shows. Um, and we do stuff like, uh, it's the only time I remember doing What Do You Do? Oh, wow. We did What Do You Do at one of those shows, and Michael and I sang it. Um, yeah, it was I'm trying to think of what else we did. We did Mr. Apollo and Busted and did you do a, Equestrian yeah, Statue. I was going to say Equestrian Statue. I, I do have one little thing, which I, I, I don't really brag about it, but it's one little brag thing. Brag away. I'm a, little bit, I'm, I'm a little bit proud of it. Um, in, in 2004... Um, well, before that, Neil had been doing a lot of touring, mm -hmm. and he would do things where he would just kind of get a, a, a he would show up, and a, a band would be there waiting for him, and without any rehearsal, they would play a set. Um, you know, these are most of the time they're big fans, mm -hmm. um, and and they were they were lots of fun, but they weren't necessarily really tight shows, like because they didn't have a lot of rehearsals in that. So, I had this little idea like I'd really like to put a band together and have stuff really rehearsed like you know really tight and then just and then have Neil come for like a couple days of rehearsal and and play some shows like that where like the band just really knows the stuff mm -hmm. and so we did we did that in 2004 we did like four shows here in the Midwest and it was um, it was a lot of rattles bonzos uh, and solo stuff and, and including some solo stuff that hadn't been released yet, like some of the songs that he and I played that day back in 2001. Um, and it's just uh, amazing shows. But I didn't realize it at the time. 
It was the very first time he ever played equestrian statue on stage. Really? Yeah. I, 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 he told me that as we were touring. I was like, you got to be kidding me. You guys never played this song. It was like one of their first singles. Yeah. They did it on Beat Club as a, you know, miming it, obviously, mm-hmm. but he had never played that song live on There's stage. There's even like a, the first a British Pathé film of them doing the yeah, Equestrian yeah. Statue. Yeah, but I guess it's that was all they were all miming. So this is the first time he actually had played it live with uh, a band, and I yeah I was really surprised by that. Uh, we also did like Humanoid Boogie and a few other things. Um, and the year before we did some shows in L.A. where we we played a bunch of unusual songs. That was th- that show. Those shows were organized by uh, Bonnie and and. Uh, Bonnie and Laurie, who had created his first big website, mm-hmm. that Words of Inspiration one. I'm not sure if you ever got a chance to see yeah. that, but um, so we we did a couple shows in LA where we played a lot of uh, extra deep cuts. You know, it was a lot of fun. Too. Um, there's a video that I saw of you, Neil, and Eric Idle uh, performing, and I would like to know the context of that because I, I I knew there was some you know hostility between the two, but you know you were there. Well, I tell you, it wasn't apparent that evening. Um, so yeah, what we did we had those um, we had two shows. We had one that was a full band, including John Altman, who you probably recognize that mm-hmm. name. He's the arranger for Ruddles, and he's played with pretty much everybody under the sun. Um, so we had one gig where it was a full band, and then we had another gig. It was at this little place in Hollywood called the Lava Lounge, and that was just me and Neil on acoustics. Mm-hmm. And um, there was also a film crew that was filming just about everything that was going on for a documentary about Neil. Mm-hmm which was called the seventh Python and it has still has never been officially released, but so everything was filmed and I don't know if, if, if they're the ones that got in touch with Eric and asked if he would come down and play some songs or not, but I'm not really sure how Eric ended up being involved, but you know, and I'd heard some of those stories too, about you know, the, the bad feelings that, and, and I knew what happened from the archaeology thing, so <laughs> there was, you know, I was worried that it might not be comfortable, but Eric was really sweet to everybody that night, treated everybody, I even the fans, you know, he signed everything that anybody wanted to sign, he was very friendly. I saw no hint of any ill feeling from anybody that night, so it was a good night. It was and, weird um, seeing him, you know, sing on a song that he had nothing to do with. Like hearing him sing on Shangri La. Yeah, well, that's it's it's kind of funny because I mean Eric, he didn't want archaeology to be done called and done on, with the name the Ruddles, mm-hmm. but he ended up obviously liking the music a lot because he used some of it for the Can't Buy Me Lunch thing. He used all of it. And 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 he really did like those songs. Like back in '64, he 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 did appreciate them and uh, and. Um, well, so I think the the thing that they knew for sure they were going to do was the philosopher song. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I think Neil said, well, "Why don't we do Let's Be Natural?" So we did that, and he brought me up for that one. And then what we do? Yeah, we and we ended it with kind of like the refrain from Shangri La. I have to say, I was just having the time of my life up there. <laughs> I've seen some pictures of me from it, just like you know, it's just shit grin, you know, I'm just, just having so much fun, you know, can't believe it, I'm looking around like, am I really here, and I, I said that to myself many times, you know, I, I realized just how lucky I was to be a part of any of that, to get to play that music with Neil, and, the, and the, some of the things I got to do, and some of the people I got to meet, the friends I made, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I still sometimes can't believe any of it happened, and, um, so yeah, and um, <laughs> you obviously knew uh, Neil quite well, and unfortunately, he is no longer with us. What what would you like people to know about Neil and is that they might not know? 
Hmm. Or what was your favorite thing question. about Neil Innes as a person? Oh, uh, well, he's just had one of those, you know, quick, quick brains. He'd always kind of be self-deprecating and say he was a man of tiny brain, but that's <laughs> it's, it's bullshit. <laughs> he was pretty, pretty bright, you know, and pretty quick and smart and, and funny. And, you know, you don't need me to tell you that. Yeah. You've seen all the evidence. But um, there was just many times we just uh, we had a lot of good moments where we were on the same page. I, I'm one of my favorite memories. Um, we had a he he wasn't really the type to listen to a lot of other people's music, <laughs> not a lot. Okay, um, but the ones that he did, he he really, I mean, he knew them inside and out, like some of the Frank Zappa stuff and um, uh, like Pet Sounds yeah. and We're Only in It for the Money by Zappa and the Mothers, um, and and obviously Beatles stuff, but um. I was so I was always surprised at how little he listened to other people's music, and I I know it's because he didn't want that to affect his own music so much. He wanted it, the music that came from him to be more. He didn't want to have so much like influence creeping yeah. in, and that's why he didn't listen to any Beatles stuff when he wrote the Ruddle songs. Um, but I one of my favorite memories was after a, a Ruddle show we did. I think it was three years ago. I, I'm I can't really remember, but we we did this sort of private gig out in this in this uh, old school, and we drank quite a bit of wine afterwards. <laughs> and we we got on the we got in the van to to hit the road to go to the hotel. And I can't remember if it was me or him, but one of us started singing uh, "Who Need Who Needs the Peace Corps" yeah. from "We're Only in It for Money," and we just kept going. And we sang, we kept singing all the bits and pieces we could remember, like for the whole album. And no one else in the van was singing along, but they didn't tell us to shut up either. <laughs> so, but for me, that was an amazing moment. It was like we had this, you know, these this this love of this album, mm -hmm. and we were just, you know, we didn't care what anybody thought. We were just having a fun time singing these these songs, which were, most of them were silly songs, but there's serious stuff there too. But it was just uh, there were moments like that. Where we would just have this fun appreciating music. Um, I mean, there's also just, he had so many jokes, and and he, I'm I'm terrible at telling jokes. I can only remember the ones that you just never want to repeat. They're yeah. just terrible, nasty jokes. For whatever reason, that's the way my mind is. So I I if if I'm lucky, I can be funny in the moment and just you know crack a joke about something that's happening, mm -hmm. but. But he he knew all sorts of hilarious jokes and witticisms and quotes and you know it was so it's it's always fun to to be in his company for things like that. Um, trying to think of I don't know is that is a question because there's so many things. Um, I don't know, Ethan. We may have to leave it there there for now. Maybe something else will come to mind, but that's all right. I would like to hit you with some quick fire questions. Okay. What is your favorite Beatles song? Oh my goodness, Beatles song. Um. Um. Okay, I'm gonna go with Rain. That that that's a good choice. For whatever reason, the 1966 John Lennon songs mm -hmm. are are like my favorites. And your bird can I'm sing. I'm only sleeping. Doctor Robert, I'm only sleeping. I, I don't know. I don't know why, but those those are the ones that resonate with me. I know. I don't know I mean, why. I love it wasn't all, a John you know? Lennon song. That was a Neil Lennon song. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yep. But yeah, I, I that I that's for whatever reason. Those are the ones that uh, I just, I don't know. There's something about them. And Rain is some of my favorite Ringo drumming, too. Oh, it's Ringo's just, on his A game. I just love those things. Paul's on his A game. John's on his A game. It's, they're all just at, you know, some of their best musical performances. Yeah. I think as far as albums go, it's it's Revolver and Pepper. Don't get too ahead of yourself. I still have more quick. <laughs> ah, okay. The, the quick fire questions. I'm what sorry. is your least Go favorite ahead. Beatles song? 
song? Um, hmm. Hmm. Oh my goodness. One that they actually wrote? Yes. Please don't say Mr. Oh, Moonlight. Please don't say Mr. Moonlight. No, I wouldn't say that could, one. That um, it, it might have to be probably one of the ones that Gosh, this is a really tough question, Ethan, because even the ones that I don't yeah. like much, I still like. You know, like, if you've got troubles, yeah. it's, you know, it's very, it's not yeah. a very good song, but I still the like Beatles it. The Beatles, they don't or really have like bad songs. They go from like, good to great. Yeah. Um, boy. I don't know. That's a tough one. I mean, even You Know My Name, I, I love that <laughs> I even went through the trouble to edit together a complete version of it that's got like all the different parts in it. Oh wow! Um, and uh, that's one of my other hobbies is kind of restoring music and that. Um, but um, boy, I don't know. It's it's really hard to say my least favorite. It's it's as hard to say that as it is what my most favorite is. But um, if you want, we can just say my least favorite and call it a day. Okay. What's that? Long and Winding Road. Yeah. Really? Oh. I find it. What is it about that you don't like? It's is it dull. the? Do you like? Do you not like the like the the version without the Phil Spector treatments? I I don't like the or Phil Spector the version, song? and I like the Let It Be Naked version even less. Oh really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. I think it's got some nice things in it. I was going to ask you I what like your favorite Beatles melodies. album was, but. You already kind of uh, let the cat slip out of the bag yeah. with that one. Yeah, it's it's that that's another tough call. Well, you I mean, said the scientifically Sergeant correct Pepper. answer, which is revolver. <laughs> that that is the correct answer. Yeah. Yeah. I even wrote a song about Sergeant Pepper. Really? Yeah. It's called Pink and Orange, Blue and Green, which is roughly the color yeah. of their uniform. It, it took me a second, but then I was like, okay, I get it. Yeah, I I just had this idea to write something. Just I, I was I think I was having this trouble writing about some. I didn't know what to write about, and I had this music. And then I said, well, maybe I'll just write about something visual. Like I'll look at a painting or a poster. And I know initially I was thinking about this one Salvador Dali thing, the uh, the uh, the Toreador <laughs> one. And I decided, no, I'm gonna. I I said, well, let's look at the Sgt. Pepper album cover. So I just looked at the cover and I started writing about what you see yeah. on the front cover, um, describing it. If you if you just read my lyrics, you'd think I was, you know, an acid yeah. or something, because it's it's like total nonsense. But when you look at the co cover, everything I'm saying makes perfect. Has sense. this song been recorded anywhere? Yeah, it's I it's on my. I did one solo album called Venus de Milo. Please raise your hand. It's on there. And if, um, if you look for my, I have a SoundCloud page that I've started to make. I put that album out on there, so you can I'll, find I'll it. I'll put there. all it's the just... links to your SoundCloud on the description okay. to the video. Yeah. So there's not much out there yet, but that album's out there, and you can find that song. Um, I still like the way it's, it doesn't sound like the yeah. Beatles. I mean, I used all my Beatle type instruments, like my Rickenbacker 12 string and my Hoffman yeah. bass and my Ludwig kit and stuff. But it's it doesn't really sound like the Beatles, but it it is about that album. What is <laughs> or sitting down and listening to the album? I guess is more um, uh, precisely what it's about. What's your least favorite Beatles album? Mm. Uh. Well, if I have to pick one, I guess it would be Please Please Me, just because it's not as much of their, their own songs. Good answer. Yeah, I mean, I love it, but it's if I had to pick one I like the least, I guess it would be that. I mean, you're not including, like, Star Clubs no. and other things. You're, they're proper yeah. albums you're talking well, if you, about. Well, if you it were going to have a hard time, I was I would have said, like, you can pick compilations. I, I The Beatles Story, that's my least favorite album. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? One? I'd be, I'd be like viscerally upset if someone said that that was their favorite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or hear the Beatles tell all. Uh, that's capitalism at their at its finest. Hmm. 
we don't allow puns on this show, my good sir. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, what's your favorite Bonzo Dog Doodah Band song? Oh, favorite song. Um, I would have to go with Equestrian Statue or Humanoid Boogie. Speaking of Equestrian Statue, do you think, now that Neil has ascended to the uh, great gig in the sky, do you think they should give him his own Equestrian Statue in the square? I don't know, but you know those blue plaques that they yeah. have? I think they should maybe they should put one of those up on the statue that's in Liverpool that inspired the mm -hmm. song. A plaque on they a statue. Be... Yeah, why not? That makes sense. What's your favorite Bonzo Dog Doodah Band album? Mm. Oh, it's gotta be Gorilla. I mean Kanchem is probably their best album, but but Gorilla is my favorite. And I, I sort of it's kind of like Life of Brian to me. I think is probably the best Monty Python movie, but Holy Grail is my favorite mm -hmm. one. It makes me laugh the most. It's the silliest. It's. I have to say, I've been listening to an awful lot of Bonzo Dog Band since all this madness started. Yeah. Since the COVID stuff started. What COVID yeah, stuff? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we've just been voluntarily not leaving our That's houses. Yeah, of these people listening to this 50 years from now, there was this thing called COVID-19. Back in my day. Um, we... Yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I, I've been playing Gorilla an awful lot the last few months because it's one of those things like, oh, I don't know. It's For me, whenever I've, whenever life is, is crap, yeah. I tend to turn to the ruddles mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, which always kind of make me you know, always make me happy. And Gorilla is one of those albums. I, I just cannot be in a bad mood when I'm playing that album. So I've been playing that and Donut and Granny's Greenhouse quite a <laughs> bit. So I have to say Gorilla. What's your favorite Ruddles song? Mm. <laughs> These are tough questions. Um, I should have known these were coming. Um, uh, I'm going to say... These oh, questions aren't really turning out to be as quick fire as I thought they were going to be. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, it's, it's, it's okay. Yeah. I'm trying to give you the real answers. No, I know. The quick I, ones. I jest. Uh, I jest. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Cheese and onions, piggy in the middle. There's, oh, it's so hard. And there's archaeology stuff to me. Even is 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 better. Like, uh, even though some of the songs weren't originally done for Shangri La, they're his solo things. But Joe Public and Shangri La. Questionnaire. I love questionnaire. Questionnaire is amazing. Yeah, I mean, it it's so hard to pick, but those. I would just I'll say accept those. that. <laughs> and lastly, what is your favorite Ruddles quote? Apart from the trousers. Apart from the trousers. Because I, I, I um, quote that on a, an, on a near daily basis, like, Shea Stadium, named after the Cuban guerrilla leader, Shea Stadium. Yeah. <laughs> or, their first album was recorded in 20 minutes. Their second took even longer. <laughs> It's all good jokes. Yeah. Um, I can quote that entire think, yeah. scene with uh, the Derek Taylor character played by uh, Michael mm -hmm. Palin. I can quote mm -hmm. that entire scene verbatim. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, man, Ethan. Um If you don't have an answer, we can pick one of mine. Oh, well, let's just do that, because there's just too many. You could have just said the whole movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Ken, where can people find you these days? Where can they find me? Uh, well, I, I live in central Illinois. Not doing a whole heck of a lot right now. 
there's no there's no gigging or anything right now. Um, they, they can find my Facebook page. They can find my um, like if you go if you're on Facebook, one thing you might want to look into. You don't even have to friend me. You can you can check these things out. I've I've uh, I've created a number of photo albums from the different Ruddles tours, and I I still have a lot to do. But there's I've done like six or seven of them, and they're they're interesting to flip to go through. It's like every photo I could find, whether it's mine or someone else's memorabilia from the tour, like posters and on stage shots. You know. Um, so it's it's worth kind of finding those things. That's the only place I've created them so far is on my Facebook page, and uh, and then there's the SoundCloud thing where I'll be putting more and more music that I was involved in, and some things from Ruddles and um, other people's music that I've been you know been able to play guitar on or sing on or whatever. I'm just starting that now, so. Um, that's kind of it's about it for now. And I want to give you my sincerest thanks for coming on the show. Are we done? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Time goes by so quickly. We can keep talking if you want. Oh to. no. Um I'm out of questions. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, I hope that there was something interesting. It was in very there. interesting. Maybe we can do uh yeah, maybe do another one someday. You think of some more questions. Once I think of some more <laughs> questions. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Ethan. It's my fun. my pleasure. To everyone else out there listening, thank you for listening. You can go home now. Bands on the Run is produced by Ethan Alexander. Additional voiceovers by Richard Felton. This has been a Showtown production.